It's a good day. Good day to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, appreciate all the, the joyful, uh, hearty conversation you can hear in the, in the congregation today. Um, we're blessed to be here today, and we're blessed to have the Lord working in our lives uh, in, in a way that brings us peace and comfort, even in the midst of trials and tests. And <clears throat> just to recap a little bit, Brother Smith is... Uh, in Nacogdoches today. Uh, the funeral for Brother John Budd will, will be today um, at 2 o'clock and will be live streamed. Um, I posted a couple, uh, three links on our Facebook page so that you could go there and uh, they're, they're linked with his obituary so you can watch the funeral if you desire to. Um, if you don't know how to get a and if you don't know how to find those links, let me know, and I'll do my best to help you with that. Um, we're going to miss Brother Bud. He was a, a man that I have held in high regard for a long time. First time I heard Brother Bud speak, I was 14 years old. And uh, he stood up on his feet, and he told three jokes, two of which I can remember today. Um, that's the kind of impact that he had on my life. And uh, it's amazing to me that, that, you know, as Brother Fisher said last Sunday, that uh, God's workmen pass, but his work goes on. And it, there's, there's, such, <clears throat> there's such a drive for our, the men of God to work hard and to uh, surrender their life um, to the Lord that it's almost impossible for them to take time off to stop. I noticed recently that there, were, there was a meeting held in New York, a Zoom meeting, and I saw on the list of speakers, Brother Billy Brown was on that list, <laughs> and I kind of chuckled because he's tried, he's tried so many times to, to back up, but he just simply can't, you know, and uh, yes, sir, and, and to the body won't let him either. that's right, Brother Durham. Um, he said that God won't let Brother Brown back up, and it's it, it's amazing, you know. There's a this calling that you that we have, um, that you and I have, is not something that you can escape. Let me tell you, there are people who try. There are people who try to escape. You know, I was reminded of the prodigal son. Prodigal son ran. He ran away from his his. Uh, his heritage but it, but it never left him and you know once you're touched by the hand of God there's no there's no escaping this and some people would fret or frown over that but I do not no in fact I'm thankful because it's what keeps you it's that touch it's that that, that no so religion that you find that you can't escape and it'll keep you. It'll hold you when you can't hardly hold yourself. And I was thinking uh, this week, I've <clears throat> made a comment here before. Um, the Apostle Peter was a worker. And uh, when Jesus found him, he was working, gathering fish, right? He was a fisherman. And he was tending to his nets. And Jesus was over there talking. And Jesus comes by and says, hey, cast me out into the into the water so and and uh, Jesus uh, or Peter obliged the Lord and and then took up he laid down his nets and he followed him but you know what happened the first thing after Jesus passed away what did Peter do he went back to fishing because he was a worker and you know we uh, myself I can relate to that I'm inclined that way and I had an experience uh, Friday, um, I got, uh, I took a day off. I haven't had a, a day of vacation. I, I don't, I can't remember the last time that I just didn't work. And so I took a day off and I had big plans and I, I've got a GPS uh, app on my phone and I had a route mapped and I was, I was packed and ready and I knew exactly where I was going and how I was going to get there, and I, I 
got my gear on and got my motorcycle out of the garage and, and started right up and I went down my mental checklist of I checked this, I did this, and you know, my oil's good and my everything. Uh, oh, I didn't check my air pressure. So I, I, I was pulling out of the driveway and I pulled right back in and I got out my pressure gauge and checked the front and put a little air in the front tire and checked the back and and I, I have a audio intercom system in my helmet and I, was, I had the Bible running in my helmet and I kept hearing this I thought it was just me when I was trying to put air in but I was wrong I had a flat I had a, a leaking air valve I've never had a valve leak on a tire but it split right down the middle and was leaking I got so frustrated not you know demonstrably you know I didn't just I didn't throw my tools or nothing like that. People do that, but I wouldn't advise it. Um, and so you know what I did? Here I was. I had a day off. I walked in the house. I put my work clothes on. I got in my truck. And I said, I'm just going to go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> I got about 10 minutes down the road, and I thought, no, I'm not. I'm not doing this to myself. I'm going to take a day off. And so I did. I, did. I went to plan B instead of plan A. You know, it's hard to rest. It really is hard to rest. And when you're a motivated person, when you have things on your mind, it's hard to stop. And even, you know, Peter, um, he went fishing. But the Lord gave uh, Peter some instructions uh, before he left this earth and uh, in the 24th chapter of Luke in the 49th verse he said behold I send you the promise I send the promise of my father unto you but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high and that must have been pretty hard for them to, to be disappointed, if you will, to have seen their, their hero, their savior, their friend, the man that they laid down everything in their life for, be taken away. And I'm sure that it just grieves them immensely. And, and I can just imagine Peter saying, now what are we going to do? They had just walked for three years with the greatest man that this world has ever known. He was the kindest, most gentle, most loving, healing, smart, wise person the world has ever known. And they spent time with him and now he's gone. And I just got to believe that it, it grieved them. And, you know, Jesus, he knew that that was going to be the case. In the 11th chapter of Matthew, in the 25th verse, Jesus was praying. He said, at, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. He said, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. If you're sitting here today in the sound of my voice and the Lord's touched your heart, it's because God purposed to talk to you. It's not because of me or it's not because of the person sitting beside you. It's because God himself desires to have you and he'll not stop you're his you are his and he can be yours he said come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls 
For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And of course, the yoke, uh, I'm not a farmer, but I have a, some knowledge of what a yoke is. But a yoke is something that you use to harness up an animal. And it wraps around their neck, and then they, you might have a, a double yoke. You might have two animals there together. And the intent there is to fasten up a wagon or a plow or some sort of, of tool that is used to either move something or move the earth. It's hard work. It's really hard work. Um, and in fact, if you get two animals yoked up together and they don't pull together, it's even harder. That's, if you get yoked up, you want to make sure that you're pulling in time. Uh, Brother Smith recounted that story of Brother uh, of, uh, Papa Wilkett. Um, I, I just know these stories because I've been in the body and I've heard them repeated. Um, but Papa Wilkett had those two mules and he, he got them harnessed up. It wasn't, I suppose it probably wasn't a yoke, but he got them harnessed up together. And they pulled that stump right out of the ground when that brand new Dodge pickup wouldn't do the job. And so if you're getting yoked up together, you're, you, you better just write it down. I'm getting ready to do some hard work. Because there's no point in being under a yoke unless, it's, unless you're working. And the, uh, but Jesus here, he said that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, it's true. It's, it's true that once you surrender your will to the Lord, once you enter into a rest with Him, it's the best life ever. It's the best thing you can imagine. In fact, it, the Bible says that eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard what God has in store for them that love Him. So here we sit today in, in Bible class and, and we learn about the Word of God and we work together to grow and develop this assembly and there's times when that yoke may feel a little grievous but boy the times that the spirit of the lord comes in like a, a refreshing rain my 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 i wouldn't trade it brother john bud even though he passed away and uh you know as the saying goes with his boots on he wouldn't trade it he wouldn't trade it brother smith today he's tired He's there in Nacogdoches and help ministering in that funeral. And he's, his heart's heavy because he lost a friend. But even in all that, you know what he would? He wouldn't trade. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now, as the song says. And so Peter, you know, he, he struggled, as we know, with uh, his... Uh, his calling in the 21st chapter of John and in the 18th verse let's see Jesus had just gotten done talking to Peter about feeding the Lord's sheep and I I I'll speak from my experience, but I think these other brethren will, would agree that you can't escape this. When the Lord lays his hand on your life and places a calling on your life, you can't escape. You just simply can't outrun it. And I don't, I don't say that in a way to say that, it's, that I'm frustrated by it. But I will tell you this. It does frustrate the flesh. Because there's times and moments when you want to do what you want to do, but it doesn't work like that. When you surrender your life and your heart to the Lord, you, you're going to be compelled to do what he wants you to do. He said here in John 21, 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, thou walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whithersoever thou wouldest not. You know, the, the joy, one of the greatest joys about serving God is the unexpected. 
the unknown. Have you ever had a miracle in your life? Have you ever had a circumstance in your life that you simply never saw coming? An event that you just didn't, you, there was no way that you could anticipate how it would turn out. And, but when it was over, or after you had experienced it, you knew, man, but God. Just like receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. How in the world could Jesus have prepared the disciples for receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost? The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came in like a flood, that it filled the room. And they spake in unknown tongues. How could he prepare them for that? There was no experience. There was, he told them, you know, he shared with them. He instructed them that they would be endued with power from on high. But how could he prepare them? He couldn't. One of the greatest things, rewards of, of living a life of faith is it gets sweeter all the time. Even in in age and even in disappointment and even in frustration and even in sorrow, there's still the joy that comes in the morning. <clears throat> in the 22nd verse, he said, if I will that he tarry, oh, let's see, he's talking about Judas. Let's go on here to the, the first chapter of Acts. In the first chapter of Acts, it says, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up afterward after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he sh showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the God of the kingdom of God you know, that must have really been a joyous experience for them. And I'm sure that it absolutely solidified their faith. Here the Lord had, had died. He was in the grave for three days. They went back to, to uh, prepare his body and he was gone. It, it, it probably... It, the times leading up to Jesus meeting them on the road probably was, was I'm sure it was gut-wrenching. I mean, just like Peter, he went fishing. He just couldn't, the sorrow probably was, was more, you know, as they'd say, more than I can bear. And, but then Jesus came and he spent 40 days with them. Wow. We'd take one day. <laughs> We'd take an hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? We would be thrilled to but they needed that they needed those 40 days for to understand to com better understand his plan to solidify their faith their confidence they needed that let me tell you something if you need something today you can receive it from the Lord the Bible says that he's an ever-present help in the time of trouble and he can bring confidence to you that, that passes all understanding. You'd be like, well, how do you know that's going to work? I just know. Well, how do you know? I can't tell you how I know. But I'm serving a mighty God. And I have faith. So, well, you have faith? Yes, I have faith. My faith is, is small. It's the size of a grain of a mustard seed. But I believe that God can move a mountain in my life. Okay. You know, and not everybody can, not everybody has that, but we do, saints of God. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that you can read this word of God and, and, and the Bible says that the promises of God are yea and amen? Aren't you glad that you have that confidence today to know that God's word is true? The Bible says, let God be true and all men liars. He said in the fourth verse of Acts 1, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jer Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days, many days hence. 
When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore unto the, the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. In other words, he was just reminded, let's not get ahead of ourselves. You know, one of, the, one of the hardest things that we can do, uh, I've said this before, <clears throat> uh, reaching, striving for perfection is like crossing the ocean. Okay? If, you, if you've ever been to the ocean or the, or the Gulf of Mexico or a large body of water, and you look out across... What do you see? More water. <clears throat> All right, so let's wait out 100 yards. What do you see? More water. You get out in a boat and you go out a couple miles. What do you see? More water. It's, it's, if you're crossing the ocean, I mean, can you imagine how brave the, the early sailors were when they loaded their, their merchant ships and such and they struck out for the new world? that they didn't even know existed. In fact, when they, when they landed in, uh, in the Americas, they thought they were landing in, in India. They didn't know the world was so big. <laughs> the perfection's like that. We, we, we've entered into this, this journey of perfection, but we can't see it. We know it's there because the Bible tells us it's there. We know it's there because God's Spirit has filled us. We've been filled with God's Spirit, and His Word is confirmed in our hearts. We know that the promise is, is there, but we can't just catch an airplane and, and be right there. And we don't even really have a complete road map. It's, the map is becoming more clear, thankfully, for men like Brother Smith and others uh, that have gone on before. Don't, lose, don't be faint at heart, though. Let's, I think, uh, I remember Brother Langer saying one time, he said, let's focus on the nasty now, now, not the sweet by and by. <laughs> Which I enjoy this, the sweet by and by, too. Don't misunderstand, because we need, that, we need the things that give us hope. But it's important for us, too, to be able to, to concentrate on what's going on now. He said... In the eighth verse, he said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into him, into heaven, as ye have seen him go into heaven. And they returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And so here they, they went and they waited and they tarried in Jerusalem, just as the Lord told them, just as he commanded them to do. You know, tarrying requires rest. It requires waiting patiently. And it's interesting, too. Here, I'll use Brother Durham, uh, for example. He won't mind. Um, Brother Durham's got a, a, he's got a heavy road. A long road ahead of him to deal with his father's passing. He's got a lot of um, paperwork to deal with, and I've often and I've been through this a couple of times with my mother, uh, and when she's lost her husband, and I've often said that death is harder on the living than it is the dead because there's there's always a lot that has to be taken care of after the fact, and so for Brother Durham, he's you know, his journey on this process, there's, there, he's just getting started, right? So rest will be hard for, for you at times. There will be times it will be hard for you to rest. Whereas for me, 
I, I don't have that burden, so my rest, my, maybe my schedule isn't as demanding. And so rest for me is not nearly as difficult to find. We're all at different, we all walk in different paths of our life. And so let's be careful, you know, with how we respond to each other and in how we don't judge uh, by the seeing of the eye and the hearing of the ear. I want to, to illustrate something uh, to you. Um, in Matthew, the 26th chapter, in the 37th verse, Let's go to the 36th verse. Matthew 26, 36. said, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. There wasn't much rest to be found for Jesus. Thirty-eighth verse said, He saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he cometh unto, this, unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch? Could you not watch with me one hour? <laughs> my my son, he's not here. He'll, he's in uh, East Texas. Uh, he'll be home this afternoon, uh, Lord willing. If he gets in the truck, forget about it. He's out. He's sound asleep. Drives me crazy. He can crawl right up in the truck and go right to sleep and not bother nobody, not be bothered by nothing. Some people are just that way, I suppose. Well, apparently, in this particular case, God had a little say in the matter, but, but Peter went to sleep too, and the sons of Zebedee. They fell fast asleep. Jesus like, can you not pray with me one hour? I mean, is that too much to ask? I'm, I'm getting ready to die, guys. Doesn't it feel that way sometimes? You know, you're, you're in the valley of decision. Your world's upside down. You think that everything's coming to a screeching halt. You're almost to a point of desperation, and everyone around you is relaxed and calm and cool as a cucumber. You know why? Because we all have to walk this journey ourselves. We all have to make our own salvation with fear and trembling. It's your duty. It's your responsibility, whether you're young or old. It's your responsibility to take hold of what God has called you to do and fulfill that. And boy, isn't it a challenge. You, because not everybody feels that burden. And... You have to pursue that regardless of those around you. Now, I'll say this. Brother Patton used to put it like this. He talked about the 30-fold, the 60-fold, the and 100-fold Christian. He said, a 100-fold Christian is a man that's, that is single or a woman that's single, and all they have to do is focus on serving God. But a 60-fold Christian, well, that's somebody who decides to go and get married. Now they're not only just having to please God, but now they're pleasing their spouse. So they can only be six, they can only give 60% or 60-fold of their, of their life to the Lord. A 30-fold Christian, well, that's somebody who gets married and has a bunch of kids. And now when they want to go to a meeting, mama says, no, the baby needs new shoes. And now it's a lot more challenging. In fact, I can remember being a 100-fold I remember living thinking I was a hundredfold Christian. How about that? I don't want to give you a false illusion. And laughing at guys like me who had a house 
you know, married and had a house full of kids and you never see them anymore at a fellowship meeting because that's what happened to me. <laughs> I got married, had kids, and was like, oh, y'all are going to campground? Have a good time. Baby needs shoes. <laughs> well, Jesus, he was carrying a burden that the apostles, the disciples couldn't carry with him. The 41st verse, he said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again a second time, and he prayed, saying, O oh, oh my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then cometh he to his disciples, and he said unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold the hours at hand that the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Now it's interesting here. It's a little bit of a contradiction, but it's not, I don't think you, it's not fair to take it that way. In the 45th verse, he says, Sleep on. And then in the 46th verse, he tells them to get up. <laughs> so, but because the rest that he's talking about wasn't so much, you know, what we did last night where we laid our head down, hopefully you all did, and, and then picked it up off the pillow. You know what's amazing too about being asleep? You don't know you're asleep until you wake up. It's kind of like death, isn't it? You don't know you're dead until you wake up. Some people never wake up. The Bible says that the ungodly are like the chap. They just perish. Their memory is forgotten. They are no more. They'll never wake up. They de when they die, they're gone. That's it. They're like the animal. But, but we know that through the resurrection process that we'll wake up. We'll be like, hey, what happened? Where am I? As a tree falls, so shall it lie. That means when you wake up, However you go down with whatever you're looking and working on, that's how you'll awaken. And that'll also determine, you know, lend itself to whether it's a resurrection of the just or a resurrection of the unjust. But here, the, the disciples, they were asleep. Uh, and it, I guess it doesn't say that here, but in another location, it indicates that God put a sleep on them. You know why? Because Jesus had to bear that cross on his own. The sacrifice of a lamb uh, for the sin offering required a lamb not be sodden with water. There couldn't be any water poured on that sacrifice. And so when Jesus was there, we all think of him sacrificing his life on the cross, right? But, but this... In Matthew 26 is when he really died. That's when he really surrendered his life. And that's why it was such a great prayer for him because it, he had to pray it three times and the Bible says that, that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. There was no sacrifice. Those disciples couldn't call on heaven for his benefit. It was a sacrifice that he had to make. They couldn't put any water on his sacrifice. God put a sleep on their eyes. But he told them, he said, sleep on. Because he could have went on to say, because your work hasn't begun yet, but it will. And it did. And aren't we glad? Peter rose up. He said, this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. The Bible says that a, the Spirit of the Lord came in like a mighty rushing wind and filled the room. Mm, hallelujah. And the, he said, this is for you and for your children and as many as the Lord our God shall call. Those men, they, they rested, they learned, they grew. And, and maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're in a place right now where, where you're learning and resting and growing and then they moved into a spot where they got under a yoke and they began to bear a load that they didn't even know that they were capable of bearing. 
And what's that? There's a saying that says, uh, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And you know, it's strange, but I found that to be true. If it wasn't true, he'd take the most talented orators. He'd take the most talented musicians. He'd take the most talented this, the most talented that. But he doesn't. He takes, uh, Paul said in Corinthians, the are nots. He said he, he took the are nots to bring to naught the things that are. We're are not saints of God. I mean, it, it seems humiliating, you know, it seems degrading almost, if we're not careful, to think of, of ourselves as, as nothing, as nobody. But the truth is, without God, we are nothing. But with Him, we're everything. Praise God. With him, we can enter into a place where we can cease from our labors, where we can trust that he will grant us the, the peace that we're looking for. The, um, it's interesting to note that Noah's Ark rested on the mountaintop. And the world was covered in water. And the Bible says in the 8th chapter of Genesis that it rested. And, you know, even then, it still wasn't safe. The world still wasn't a safe place, even after the ark came to a rest. We're, we live in a world, in, a, in a, our society right now, it's, it's, not, it's not a safe environment. Uh, and it's, it feels, you, you almost feel kind of, I'm going to use a term, I hope it, you don't take this offensive, but you almost feel chicken sometimes because of the way, because you're, you're hindered from going about your business, from doing the things that you would on a normal basis. But, but don't feel that way. The Bible says for us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, and we need to understand that the world's not safe. And even with our provisions that we've taken with our social distancing and our masks and our our COVID uh, precautions. God expects us to use good judgment in how we pursue things. And just like Noah, even though the, the boat, I mean, you, he had to know that everything came to a stop. He'd been sloshing around in the waves, what, for 100, over 100 days. The Bible says the water was on the earth for 150 days, I think. And he had to know that something happened but he didn't know what. It, it wasn't safe to go out. And, of course, we know that he sent out a raven and a dove. And, and just to recap that a little bit, the, the raven never came back, but the dove did. Why wouldn't a raven come back? Because a raven, a raven feasts on dead things. I got news for you. There's some, there's some folks that are never coming back, Okay. As much as it pains me to say that and it hurts me to say that, there's some people that are never coming back because they are satisfied with feasting on death. Their diet is death. The dove, it came back with an olive branch. And that's a you know, tremendous, it's, it's very interesting for me to, to consider olive, you know, the, to me, it, I guess, and I haven't heard anybody say this, and if I have, I've forgotten. But I guess I would say that it's a reflection of wisdom. That, you know, we take the olive, the fruit of the olive tree, and we squeeze the oil, and that's what we use to light this lamp of, of life in our, for the world to see. And so, I, to me, the dove even recognized that it's not safe. It wasn't suitable. It wasn't uh, a place for man to walk, uh, to walk yet. And then, uh, but when he came back with the olive branch, it indicated that there was a time. It was coming. And I think it was 40 days later that Noah opened the door. Now, I'm not going to get off into a time element on that, but I will say this. You should know that, that there's coming a day in, in this earth when the Lord has washed it clean. And all remnants of, of sin and wickedness are gone. 
and it will be safe. It will be a safe place for God's people to dwell. Praise God. That's, that is such a great hope. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to fathom. It's hard to comprehend when we see so much recklessness and, and endangerment and selfishness and brutality that goes on in our society. But there's coming a day. There's coming a day when there'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more oppression. There'll be no more of man, uh, you know, taking advantage. It'll be God's way, and God's way is perfect. Hallelujah. The, uh, I want to read a couple of psalms to you um, before I let you go. Uh, let's turn over to Psalms 27, 41. Um, Psalms 27, I'm sorry, Psalms 27, 14. Psalms 27, 14 said, Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalms 40, verse 1, says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Psalms 52 and 9, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. Psalms 55 and 6, I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. For them I would fly away and be at rest. And let's read Psalm 16 and 9. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also rests in hope. Saints of God, we can enter into a rest today. That's why we come to the house of God. The Bible says to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. You can walk into the congregation today. You can enjoy the songs of Zion. You can feel at liberty to worship. You can feel at liberty to testify from the young to the old. You can make this your home. Uh, Brother Clyde Patton used to say, you can, let the toes, you can let your toes roll on out to the end of your shoes, and you can be at rest. This is your house of worship to, for you to be a part of. The Lord's added you here. Enjoy it. Make it your home. Make today a day of rest, a day of sanctuary for your soul. Praise God. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you upstairs.